Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julia Caro, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Next Generation Sequencing Approaches for the Identification of Novel Fusions and Pharmacogenomic Targets in Cancer. The sponsor of this webinar is Illumina. Our panelists today are Dr. Claire Atwool, Product Marketing Manager for Oncology at Illumina, and Dr. George Sharamis, co-head of the Advanced Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and we encourage you to do so. You can do this through the control panel, which normally appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box on the upper right side of the control panel, and when you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask our panelists your questions after the talks have concluded. So our first speaker is Dr. Atwell. Please go ahead. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining. I know that you are uh, eager to hear Dr. Sharamis talk today. Um, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to provide some detail about how the RNA fusion panel that he's going to discuss works. So Illumina has an expanding portfolio of targeted panels for cancer research, covering variants of interest for germline studies, hematological malignancies, and solid tumors. We also recently launched two RNA panels that cover many different cancer types for fusion detection gene expression profiles, and variant detection. TrueSign RNA fusion covers 507 genes that have been associated with gene fusions in cancer. Um, and TrueSight RNA pan cancer covers those same 507 genes plus an additional 800 plus cancer uh, associated genes. Today, Dr. Sheremus will talk about using TrueSight RNA fusion to study sarcomas but the panel can also be used to assess many different cancer types isolated from different samples such as blood, bone marrow, and FFPE tissue. The panel covers 507 fusion-associated genes, as I said. One of the key benefits is that you can detect fusion partners that are not specifically targeted by the panel, so we only need to have one of those um, genes targeted to detect that fusion. And I'll show you how that works in a few moments. We also provide an analysis solution that reports any potential fusions detected. And despite the large content of the panel, because of this enrichment approach, libraries can be run on our lowest, lowest throughput sequences, the MySeq or the MiniSeq, at eight samples per run. So here's a scheme of the library preparation protocol. Uh, the assay requires only 10 nanograms of high quality RNA, total RNA. And for degraded samples such as formalin-fixed paraffin embedded tissue, the input depends on the RNA quality, and that typically ranges between 20 and 100 nanograms. For high-quality RNA, the first step is to fragment that. For FFP material, you just skip that step. So we then do cDNA synthesis, adapter ligation, and amplification to create whole transcriptome libraries. And then we do hybrid capture or enrichment with our probes targeting those 507 genes of interest. So we pull those down, we elute, um, amplify, and then we sequence our libraries. So how do we detect fusions? So we pull down the gene of interest, as shown in this uh, figure on the left. Um, and because we use an enrichment approach, any fusion partner will be pulled down uh, as well. So in this example on the left, we're only targeting gene 1. But you can see that the probes capture fusions that contain gene 2, so this example here and in these examples here. When sequenced with <coughs> Illumina's paired end sequencing, where we read from each end of the fragment, um, we can either sequence wild-type pairs, so non-fusion supporting reads, um, or we get two different types of fusion reads. One is called a split read, where we sequence directly through the breakpoint with one of the reads, and that's indicated both here and here. And the other is what we call a paired read, where read one maps to one gene, say BCR, and read two maps to another gene, say ABLE1. We don't actually sequence the breakpoint, but we map to two different genes. And so in this way, the panel can detect both previously identified and novel fusion gene partners. 
I mentioned before that we provide an analysis solution for TrueSight RNA fusion. Uh, this is available either as an on-site solution uh, with the MySeq or the MiniSeq, and it's also available in base space. The local solution only reports potential fusion genes, so it does not give you gene expression or variant information. Um, but you can see here that although the panel covers 500 genes, the number of fusions that are identified in a sample are typically very low, and this is just an example um, of, a, of the results from a sample here. Um, I should point out that our analysis solution does not favor known fusions over unknown fusions. It really just uses the quality of the fusion supporting reads, so it's very much a discovery tool. If you are interested in detecting uh, gene expression profiles and variant information as well as the fusions, then the base space RNA seq alignment app um, can perform those can perform that. We also have a number of research use only and FDA cleared assays for the genetic health field. And today, Dr. Sharamas is going to discuss an interesting utilization of TrueSite 1, which we refer to as our clinical exome. TrueSite 1 is much larger than our other targeted panels, covering all regions associated with clinical phenotypes, which is over 4,800 genes. And this allows researchers, research labs to run a single comprehensive assay rather than multiple smaller panels or single gene tests. So with that brief introduction, I'll turn it back over to Julia, but just a note that if you're going to be at AACR next week, please do stop by our booth, which is number 2907, um, and, and say hello. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Dr. Atwood. So as a reminder to our participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. So next up is Dr. Sharamis. Please go ahead. Thank you. So. I want to start by thanking Illumina for inviting me to give this webinar and to Genome Web for hosting. This is the obligatory slide stating that the opinions are mine and that any use of products that I describe today may not be cleared or approved by the FDA and that Illumina is compensating me to speak today. So today I'm going to talk about two next generation sequencing assays that we have developed for sarcomas. One is an RNA based assay designed to aid in the detection of fusion genes. The other is a DNA-based assay that is intended in discovering variants in the tumor that may be previously associated with drug therapies, not necessarily indicated for sarcomas. Although our intended use of these assays are for sarcomas, they are applicable to other cancers. The overall goal of this talk is to show you how these NGS assays can be better than conventional molecular tests, and I will use patient cases to highlight this fact. But first, what are sarcomas? Sarcomas are cancers of the connective tissue. They are rare, accounting for about 2% of all cancers. They are of mesenchymal origin and can be either bone sarcomas, otherwise known as osteosarcomas, or soft tissue sarcomas, pertaining to muscles, tendons, fat, etc. In fact, there are more than 50 types of sarcomas. Here are just a few of the more common types. They are typically characterized by having numerous complex chromosomal rearrangements, but approximately one-third are caused by gene fusions with relatively few other chromosomal changes. Interestingly, some genes, such as EWSR1, are promiscuous in that they have been identified to fuse with numerous partners, and the different fusion combinations may lead to different sarcoma subtypes. To use EWSR1 as an example, here is a table where EWSR1 has been identified with 15 different fusion partners, and depending on the fusion, can manifest in any of six different sarcoma subtypes. So an assay that looks for only the presence of an EWSR1 rearrangement, such as FISH, may not be enough to diagnose a tumor. So typically, diagnosing sarcomas are made after an accumulation of evidence using pathology, looking at cell morphology and combining immunohistochemical analysis or electron microscopy, and using conventional molecular techniques such as FISH RT and uh, RT-PCR to hopefully confirm the diagnosis. Treating sarcomas can be difficult as it depends on the determination of the sarcoma subtype. Most patients will follow surgery with adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy. If this is unsuccessful, some patients may be fortunate to have an experimental targeted therapy and or clinical trial as an option. But given the numerous subtypes and the few targeted drug options, these patients could benefit from more of a global screen of pharma, pharma options, depending on the genetic variant profile of the tumor, with the hope of matching a tumor variant with a drug whose intended purpose is some other cancer. With little options for many of these patients, this is a welcome scenario. I mentioned that treatment is determined based on the identification of the, of the type of sarcoma. 
Well, there are often challenges in confirming clinical suspicions with conventional molecular techniques because some assays only examine one of the fusion partners at a time, and some techniques require a prior knowledge of not only both fusion partners, but the anticipated breakpoints. So a solution for this would be examining a panel of genes simultaneously and without having to know the second partner. The sarcoma fusion panel that I'm describing today helps to contribute to the evidence that would support a particular subtype by looking more broadly across genes of interest where you're not limited to the published and frequent breakpoints and has the potential to identify an atypical or novel fusion partner. This assay um, also has the added benefit of making fusion calls where the quality and or quantity of the source RNA material is lower than what would be acceptable in the conventional methods. This is hugely important because it, it is not always possible to go back for additional material and can reduce the turnaround time for those difficult cases. For this panel, we use the TrueSight RNA Fusion Library Prep Kit that targets 507 genes associated with fusions in cancer. We had to modify the bioinformatics pipeline by including a second fusion caller, and we had to include a QC step to help us to discern a negative call from a failed assay. We did this by examining the profile of a series of genes, and since there are no actual housekeeping genes included on this panel, we dubbed these our proxy housekeeping genes. And as Claire mentioned on the MySeq, we run eight cases at a time. I'm not going to go into the chemistry since Claire gave an overview, but the bottom line is that you can simultaneously analyze numerous fusion gene targets and you don't have to have the previous knowledge of the second partner. So what did we change? Well, the bioinformatics pipeline did not work perfectly in our hands out of the box. Sorry, Claire. They use a fusion caller called Manta. So we evaluated about eight different fusion callers based on, of course, sensitivity and specificity, but also the analysis runtime. We noticed that many of the data sets published for these callers were derived synthetically, mixed with a few cases with, with actual fusions. And when we evaluated them, they were not totally reproducible in sarcomas. But out of the list, we kept Illumina's Manta caller. Although not perfect, it performed well enough to include. But we added a second caller in the pipeline called Jaffa. Here is the paper published in 2015 that describes it. Our pipeline currently is sequential, and including the, se the sequencing can take more than 25 hours to complete. This format is because the Manta caller is a Windows-based executable script, and the, and the rest is Linux-based. So we have to initiate a manual start of the second caller. We've recently been able to bring Manta into our Linux environment, and with a boost in hardware to support the simultaneous execution in an automated pipeline, we think we can shave five or more hours off the runtime. But more importantly, we can walk away and come back to the final results without an interruption. Next, we implemented a QC step to help answer the question, is it negative or did it fail? We validated our assay based on 361 sarcoma samples, and we looked at the profile of all genes, focusing on changes when we know that the samples failed due to poor quality. We identified 15 genes that we use as proxy housekeeping genes. By normalizing their coverage, it helps us to set one universal threshold across all genes, despite differences in their average range of expression. If 10 or more of these genes, of these 15 genes, have a value above the threshold of minus two, we consider the sample to have passed the QC. Five or more of these genes that fall below the threshold indicate a failed sample. Unfortunately, we have to expend the time and reagents before determining a failed sample. In our validation, this is accounted for about 4% that needs repeating, and these seem to be quite conservative thresholds. But we do recommend that Illumina include actual housekeeping genes in the future for many um, tissue types. Coming back to the benefits of the panel, I want to now show you some cases that highlight these points. The first case is one where a common fusion pairing was identified, but with an uncommon breakpoint. This case is a male in his late 40s who presented with what was described as a carcinoma of the neck. A sarcoma pathologist was consulted and thought to query a myopathelial carcinoma based on the tumor cell morphology and the presence of two protein markers. This was initially supported further after ruling out some sarcomas, given that three molecular analyses were performed, some cases more than once, and did not detect the presence of an EWSR1 or a FUS rearrangement. 
With, the diagnosis, with this diagnosis, the only management would be surgery alone with watchful waiting. So what did our NGS fusion panel find? We found an EWSR1 Fly1 fusion, but with numerous unconventional breakpoints. This was repeated and it had the exact same results. This finding was supported diagnostically by RT-PCR for at least one of the breakpoints, and the pathologist noted that management of this tumor as Ewing sarcoma is advised. It is still puzzling why FISH, performed twice by two different labs in two hospitals, did not identify an EWSR1 rearrangement, but nonetheless, an EWSR1 Fly1 fusion changes the diagnosis to Ewing sarcoma, and more importantly, changes the management to include adjuvant chemotherapy. Subsequently, FISH also confirmed the Fly1 rearrangement. The second case highlights the ability of NGS to detect novel fusion partners. For this case, we have another male in his 40s who presented with a soft tissue lump in his thumb. A community pathologist noted that this was a probable schwannoma, but referred for a consult by a sarcoma uh, pathologist who, based on morphology, stated that it was reminiscent of low-grade fiber myxoid sarcoma. The important thing for this talk is that this could be molecularly confirmed by the identification of an FUS CREB3L2 fusion. Two separate labs performed FISH and confirmed the presence of, of an FUS rearrangement. Interestingly, NGS did not call an FUS rearrangement. NGS found a high confidence fusion call that included exon 2 of the FOS B gene, a gene which is covered on this panel because FOS B gene uh, fusions have been previously reported and actually in uh, sarcoma-like tumors. When you look at the reads closer to see the fusion partner, we find it located on chromosome 16. It maps specifically in the third exon of a gene set D1A, and this gene is not covered on this panel. It had a high mapping score, and when you blast the sequencing read, you find that it is found only within FOSB and set D1A. And if you prefer UCSC's BLAT tool, the same is true, only set D1A and FOSB. We were able to confirm this finding with our tPCR. So what about the FUS call? Was this a false positive that occurred in two separate labs? When you look at the locations of set D1A and FUS, they are actually only 240 KB apart. FISH uses something called break-apart probes, which I'll touch on later. But basically, the green and orange signal are separated from each other when a rearrangement occurs between them, while FUS is immediately between them. Set D1A is not far off. But although it is novel, does a set D1A fusion make sense for this tumor? We know that set D1A is not entirely novel to cancer. It has been involved in regulating metastasis in breast cancer. But what about fusions? Set D1A is a member of the KMT1 family of methyltransferases and has the alias KMT2F. Although it's poorly, uh, poorly uh, characterized, the KMT2A enzyme, otherwise known as MLL, is involved in mixed lineage leukemia. And while I'm not aware of Set D1A's history of rearrangements, in frame gain of function fusions have been found in MLL and accounts for approximately 10% of leukemias. And if a set D1A fu fusion is truly causative, and with a deeper understanding of its role, there is a potential of targeted therapies in much the same way therapies are proposed for MLL. So it would be great to see if others have encountered set D1A fusions in sarcomas. The next case will highlight how successful this panel can be with poor quality and quantity RNA. And this case is about a woman with what was described as a melanoma of the small bowel. And while the evidence supported favoring mucosal melanoma, the question of metastatic versus primary lingered, and the bowel was resected. Through a series of events, a second opinion was sought because an alternate diagnosis would alter treatment and provide potentially more options than with the initial diagnosis. The sarcoma pathologist was consulted and immediately noticed that the tumor contained a prominent infiltrate of osteoclast-type giant cells. 
understand. The importance of this is that the diagnosis was immediately changed from a melanoma to a sarcoma, clear cell sarcoma-like tumor of the GI tract. To confirm this, there are two molecular possibilities, an EWSR1 CREB1 fusion or an EWSR1 ATF1 fusion. And determining the correct fusion is important because these fusions are shared amongst many, multiple tumor types and therefore of diagnostic significance. FISH was performed, and as I mentioned, when the EWSR1 is intact, the probe signals are in close proximity to one another. But a fusion would cause them to break apart, hence the name. For this case, we can see the presence of classical break apart signals. But this only tells you that this case is positive for a rearrangement of the EWSR1 gene. The fusion partner is unknown. What is notable about this case is that the RNA quality of this sample, shown on the left, was poor. To determine this, we use the DB200 metric, which is a score calculating the percentage of RNA fragments above 200 nucleotides relative to the whole amount. This patient sample had a score of 45, and while a good example from the same run had a score of 20, uh, uh, 74, a DB200 score between 30 to 50 would be considered a poor sample, 50 to 70 would be medium, and above 70 would be considered high. Less than this would be considered a failure. And these scores guide the amount of RNA that you should use in your prep. So our case was in the low range, and we feel that a better metric would be by, to eliminate the excessively high fragments as they would artifact, they would as artifact inflate the score. We tend to look at the score between 200 and 2,000 nucleotides. This happens to keep this uh, sample in the low range. But for our good, our good example on the right, it drops it into the medium range and indicates that we should consider adding more RNA um, for that sample. Overall, the final library looked good. And the, the importance of this metric is that while the FISH results looked good, the sample failed RT-PCR. Fortunately, we didn't have to go back to get more sample. In spite of the poor RNA, NGS was able to detect the rarer EWSR1 fusion. And the pathologist noted, in contrast to a tumor with the EWSR1 CREB1 fusion, that this is a very rare neoplasm, which is associated with a high rate of local recurrence in metastasis. Therefore, diagnosis was changed from melanoma to this rare sarcoma, and the patient was managed accordingly. The last case is a bit of an unsolved mystery. A woman presented with uterine fibroids and bleeding and had a total hysterectomy with both ovaries removed. The pathologist examined the tissue and noted a cancer of the myometrium with three possibilities on her differential, either a low-grade or high-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma or a dedifferentiated leiomyosarcoma. sarcoma. The first two are characterized by, by very different fusions, but unfortunately, RT-PCR was negative for either. This is a new case, and we have not yet performed the fusion panel. So unfortunately, this patient has an aggressive form of cancer, but its identity remains a mystery. However, we are still able to help this patient while the diagnosis is being sorted out. And this uh, leads to the second part of my talk. I described earlier that some cases may be fortunate to have a variant associated with a drug, possibly for another indication or a clinical trial, but that a pharmacogenomic screen of the tumor would be necessary. So we have developed a tumor DNA-based assay that uses Illumina's TrueSight 1 Enrichment Library Prep Kit. This kit was intended to mimic exome sequencing by targeting more than 4,800 genes associated with a clinical phenotype. It was really meant for germline analysis, but we have repurposed this kit by modifying it for FFPE and only focusing on variants that may have a drug therapy associated with it. The patients that we have examined have little options left in their standard care, and this and the screen is intended to yield one more option. Our bioinformatics includes annotating with allele frequencies in the publicly available 60 NCI tumors, reported somatic data from COSMIC, and any prior associations in databases to drugs, no matter the indication. 
To provide meaningful results, we're currently filtering for genes that are known to any cancer or the genes involved in drug metabolism, like the cytochrome P450 genes. And this leads to a clinical research report. And while we're reporting on potential immediate options, we're collecting data on all 4,813 genes. So for these rare cancers, we hope to be able to go back to this to understand the disease etiology or, or possibly identify new drug targets. So coming back to our unsolved mystery, we had performed our pharmacogenomic screen on her tumor. And here are some of the sequencing metrics. 28 million reads pass filter, about 95% Q30, a transitions transversions ratio of three. Typically with exome sequencing runs on germline samples, you expect the TSTV ratio to be approximately 2.8, but quite variable in tumors, ranging from less than one to greater than eight. But for sarcoma samples, we were always seeing ratios around three. But we were not concerned by this value since the 2014 paper comparing four different library prep chemistries aimed at exome sequencing tumors happened to use osteosarcomas as a model. And while they examined many other metrics, they too discovered TSTV values of around three. So this builds confidence in the success of our run. In this patient's tumor, we identified an EGFR variant, which was exciting because it made the patient eligible and she was recruited for a phase two clinical trial investigating the use of afatinib, a panher inhibitor. And we hope to identify alternate therapies for many other patients. We have little remaining management options, so stay tuned. Um, so in summary, and I know I'm running through this quite quickly, but uh, our fusion panel targets 507 genes but has the added benefit of identifying novel fusion partners. The panel is great for poor quality and quantity of RNA, and we feel that because the expected turnaround time is currently in comparison with conventional molecular methodologies, there is room for improvement, but currently this assay may not be suitable for all cases, especially urgent ones. We think that Illumina should, in the next version, include actual housekeeping genes known over a range of tissue types. And we feel that anyone in the business of developing bioinformatics resources, like fusion callers, should use samples with actual fusions and not just synthetically derived data sets. Further research potential could be a database to share in some of these novel fusions and interesting cases that go with it. Maybe ClinVar could be involved here. And further study is warranted of the fusions typically recurring but not known to be driving tumor genesis to see if there are complex pathogenic roles for these passenger variants such as perhaps an instigating event preceding the translocation. The pharmacogenomic screen targets more than 4,800 genes. We have found that the TrueSight One kit can support FFPE DNA, but this is depending on the purpose and the required read depth. Depending on the sequencer used and the volume of cases, this can be an expensive endeavor relative to off-the-shelf pharmacogenetics panels available today. But this design bodes numerous potential from a research perspective, especially for rare cancers and for ca cases with very limited resources. And if blood is available, this assay could also double to confirm germline variants. And finally, in our lab, we intend to improve our, database, our databases that curate all of our findings, as well as continually improve our bioinformatics pipeline. And we intend on automating these tests as much as possible by introducing liquid handlers, reducing uh, the necessity for conventional molecular techniques, and validate on our next seeks to reduce cost while the volume support the higher throughput. I want to end with a quote by a Canadian-born physician, Sir William Osler, who in the late 1800s said, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And I think he was talking about precision medicine, a term that has defined the ultimate goal for all of us in the field of medical genetics and genomics. And I feel excited about how the two assays described today contributes to this theme of precision medicine. I'll end by acknowledging all of those who helped in the development of these assays. A big thank you to the Diagnostic Lab, Especially our technologist, David Swanson, who is our local technical expert, has contributed greatly in all aspects of this test. Our bioinformatician, Andrew Wong, whose name I'm reluctant to share with the world, as he is instrumental in, in, in everything after sequencing. 
our charge technologist Eva Agro and senior lab manager Sharon Crafter, who put in the extra time and efforts with dedication to make these tests possible. Our cited genetics group, especially Dr. Zelena Kolomitz and Abdul Noor, who along with technologists Jeanne and Comte and Teresa Schrodel, helped with the fish test that I, that I showed today. Of course, our pathologists, especially those involved, uh, specializing in sarcomas, our pathologist-in-chief, Dr. Rita Kandel, our staff pathologist, Dr. David Howarth, and especially Dr. Brendan Dixon, who contributed the cases that I showed today and was involved from the very beginning in the design of the fusion tests. And Dr. Albi Razak, the lead in the Sarcoma Medical Oncology Division, a joint service between Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and Princess Margaret Hospital. He was completely instrumental in developing the pharmacogenomic screen by contributing his cases and his expertise, and he is the PI of the clinical trial that I described today. And finally, of course, the patients, whose samples make immediate impact on the rapidly evolving field today and a lasting impression on the direction of our field, contributing many new possibilities for the patients of tomorrow. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharamis. Uh, I also want to remind our participants that now is the time to put your questions into the Q&A box. But just before we enter the Q&A, we would like to ask our attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey to provide us with your feedback. So we will now start with the Q&A portion. One question we have is regarding reimbursement for the testing. Um, especially from insurance companies in the U.S. And in particular, um, the, the, the person asks uh, if, whether there's insurance coverage even without a definitive, definitive clinical utility of this test. Um, another question the person is asking is um, whether genetic counseling is included as a requisite for testing when you are reporting back germline mutations. So those are both, both very good questions. Um, with respect to reimbursement being in Canada, and I know this is a hot topic in the United States with uh, your new administration, but here in Ontario, um, we have a, a program that funds uh, the fusion, the fusion um, test. <laughs> and uh, I can't speak to how it works in, in, the United, in, uh, in the U.S. in terms of reimbursement with insurance. Um, but um, with the second question, oh, genetic counseling. So genetic counseling um, is not included as part of this test. It's considered as um, no different than the other, the other um, molecular tests that we do. But um, it's all added as layers of evidence to help support the, diagnos the diagnosis. Um, most of the positive cases are sporadic. By the way, coming back to the reimbursement issue, um, in Ontario, it's, it's funded through the Cancer Care Ontario uh, program. Okay, great, thank you. A question about the housekeeping genes. Um, are all 15 housekeeping genes they're using right now applicable to RNA from any tissue? And have you tested the performance of these genes on many different RNA sources? So no, we haven't tested it on anything but the sarcomas. There are very, we have lots of different types of sarcomas in terms of the, uh, the we have 361 cases and they're varied in terms of the types of sarcomas, but we haven't tried it outside of that. We do have our own um, sort of, of um, criteria. Um, so we look for everything with a, a, an expression that is non-zero. So it has to be expressed across. And we look for variants across the 361 genes. Uh, 361 samples, sorry. So we don't see um, a lot of fluctuation. And when we included the cases that we know were really bad and poor, we actually um, could see that our score um, captured that and included a few others because we try to be conservative. And uh, even for ones where we actually identified, the, the, the sample was poor, but we identified um, the correct um, uh, variant correct fusion, so so we were able to um, sort of push that metric higher to capture a little bit more and be a little more conservative. Okay, thank you. Here's a question for either George or Claire. Uh, can someone start with a paired RNA-seq analysis 
in order to infer novel fusions and then utilize your kit to further validate the results. So uh, someone's asking if we can use a paired RNA-seq. So I'm assuming they're referring to correct. tumor bubble pair. Correct. That's correct. Paired RNA-seq analysis. Mm -hmm. Can you sorry, repeat that second part? Okay, so the question is, could someone yeah. start with a paired RNA-seq analysis first, so start with that, in order to infer novel fusions, and then after that utilize your kit to further validate the results? I imagine um, they could. Yeah, uh, yeah I think could. theoretically they could, um, but you're kind of using, you're using the same approach twice, sort of, one's an enrichment and one's not, I guess, but, but yes, I think the answer is yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, question for George. Can you look at the coverage of candidates that don't show fusions as a QA step in order to conclude that a candidate is not fused? So can we identify? I don't think so because the callers are calling fusions. They're not calling the, the it's not making an, a definite call for an, the absence of a fusion. So you could look at it manually and look at the cross those breakpoints that you're expecting and to see what kind of coverage you have. And we have metrics that actually tell us the coverage across the genes of interest, um, so you could in that way. But um, I think it's harder to, to sort of use the fusions as the metric and more stringent when you do it that way than it would be if you, if you just uh, tried to look for the absence of a fusion in a normal um, case. I, that... I can just add to that. So with our um... With the Illumina local software, uh, we do provide information. So if you have a, a CML, for example, and you're expecting a BCR able and you don't, we don't call one, we do show the um, expression of the BCR enabled genes that did not support a fusion. So you can at least say you, we did pull them down and sequence them. Um, so the idea is to give you confidence that if a fusion is not called, that it's because it's not there and not because there was something went wrong with the assay. Um, so that's another another way, but I think also um, Dr. Sharama's approach of using these housekeeping genes is, a, is another good way to know that you have confidence in your assay. Okay, thank you. Um, Good question for George. Uh, in what percentage of samples are you unable to find a clinically relevant fusion in your sarcoma patients? So you're asking for the percentage of negative cases? I believe that's what the person is asking, yes. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on, on the cases that you're submitting. Um, and your, and your index of suspicion. So it, it's a hard question to answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, have you tested the RNA fusion panel on samples with less than 10 nanograms of RNA, and could it be adapted for use in cell-free samples? So we haven't done cell-free DNA. Um, I can tell you that in-house, um, we have tried less, and it can work, but obviously the less input you use, the riskier it is. So um, right. it, it's possible. It, we recommend 10 nanograms if you can. Right, and the same. We've, we have tried with less than 10, um, but uh, it, it is variable, and we wouldn't trust the data. Mm -hmm. Ones where, in cases where we've seen um, a failed result, we have seen that with higher than than, than that amount in some cases where it failed some of our other QC metrics. Um, so it's, uh, you have to take everything in, into account when you're, when you're trying to run through this. Okay, thank you. Uh, question about the fusion caller. Um, was the addition of the Jaffa fusion caller purely for identifying novel fusions or did it benefit the known cause as well? Well, the Manta caller from our validation wasn't complete and it missed a, a few. But we found that in combination between that and the Jaffa, there are some, there are many more, like the majority of them are, are, um, are uniform in their calling, but we were able to capture um, the remaining in our 361 cases that we've used. So that's why. And we've tested 
all of the other ones, as I'd mentioned. Um, and we just found that this combination gave us, was perfect for our types of cancers. Maybe it's different for others. Okay, thank you. Question for either of you. Uh, what are your recommendations for using very degraded RNA? I would say use as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've, uh, we've ta I mean, the SASA is pretty tolerant of very poor quality and quantity. Um, we do have, um, we have tried some different kits to help with the extraction. Um, and we have actually used uh, DB200 of less than 20 with success. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't uh, hang my hat on it on every single case. It's good okay, that this great. is a Thanks. piece of line of evidence. It goes with everything else to, to help um, with the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the sensitivity of the fusion detection, and how does it vary depending on the tumor cellularity? So the sensitivity, we, so with the sensitivity that we've, we've assays that we've done, it's hard to do a metric for sensitivity. We typically have just used more of the uh, limited detection scores, which is the important aspect of us going, going forward um, in, a, in a full workup and validation. And, and we've had the fortune of doing 400 cases going forward. So uh, with that lim limit, we're at, um, from an analytical perspective, 100% when we use these, these um, these metrics, but from a from a clinical sensitivity perspective, that really depends on on as as I mentioned earlier the um, the level of suspicion. So it's a it's a difficult question to answer for this type of. Yeah, and I would add to that that we um, the, the the fact that this is RNA makes setting a limit of detection more difficult because your ability to call a fusion gene is going to be affected directly both by the endogenous expression levels of the two genes that are not fused and then by the expression level of that novel fusion partner of the, or of the fusion partner. Um, so if you have a very highly expressed fusion and relatively low endogenous gene signal, it's very easy to detect. If you have a low expressed fusion and then but a high endogenous signal, it can be more difficult. So the limit of detection is, is context dependent. Um, so we actually have not specified a limit of detection for this assay because we don't feel that it would be reliable. We can, you know, you can do a serial dilution of one sample, but that limit of detection is only specific to that fusion in that context. Um, in, in the studies that we've done, we, we does look like we can get down to 5% quite robustly, but again, I would hesitate to call it. We don't call that a spec. That's, that's what we've observed. But if, the, if uh, the person asking the question is is a director of a diagnostic lab and is thinking about this, I'll just let them know that 100% of all previously cases positive by RT-PCR in fish have been, have been positive by this assay. And uh, for the cellularity question, um, we've had success with very small biopsy fragments. Thank you. One participant wants to know whether you think that the fusion gene sequences can be integrated into a microarray. So, hmm, I would think I that that removes the the aspect of the novel partner. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I for a SNP array, it would be tricky. I would think. Um, an expression arrays, yes, I think you could, um, yeah. but I agree you would need to be, you would be hypothesis driven at that point. You would have to choose your fusion breakpoints. Right. Right, obviously that takes away from the mm -hmm. uh, novel fusion findings. Um, have you used this panel in other types of cancer other than sarcoma, specifically breast cancer? No, we have not. But it should and be amenable. Are you planning to? Or? 
not me personally because I'm not um, I'm not aware of of uh, somatic fusions that have any kind of clinical management associated with it. So I don't see the I personally don't know of uh, I, I don't think we'll be doing that anytime soon. But if there is evidence to support the utility in this, then for for uh, breast cancers, then I, uh, yeah, definitely. Great, thanks. Uh, it works well the, with, with the rest of the of the lab's workflow. So. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, here's a rather technical question. So, the, for the true site RNA fusion panel, somebody wants to uh, know why it is important to perform the hybridization and capturing twice, and whether you use this to increase the specificity, and whether you have tested uh, whether it works with, when you skip the second hybridization. Uh, yes, so we found that we get much cleaner data with the two hybridizations. When we skip the second hybridization, we have much more noise still, so it just gives you much cleaner data. Yeah, and, and this is um, common for a lot of the enrichment preps to do it twice. Okay, thank you. Okay. So a question for George, um, what criteria have you used to select patients that you use the panel on? Well, uh, sarcomas are, are rare and we're one of uh, a few centers where we're, um, we're, we are actually the largest uh, sarcoma center in Canada, so we're, we're able to capture 400 cases um, quite simply and reasonably. So, there isn't any other criteria except for the fact that we use every positive that we can possibly run through it to validate it. Okay. I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers the question, but. Right. Um, here's a question uh, about the caller, the fusion breakpoint caller again. So, can you clarify what the Illumina provided software was able to do relative to what the Jaffa caller added? So the Illumina software is Manta, and I'm just going to ask my colleague here, what's the percentage of Manta? We can get like three, yeah. three out of 400. So basically the Manta caller missed three cases out of 400. So it's not, it's uh, pretty robust. Um, but if it's only a, an expensive computational, um, you know, a computational resources, then we feel confident to to include um, both both callers. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Just a quick reminder: since we have a few more minutes for questions, please do submit any questions you might have into the Q and A box right now. Um, one question for Claire is uh, whether Illumina has plans for updating the panel and the software. Um, so the panel just launched, so I don't imagine that it will be updated um, within the next year. Um, I think we'll, we need to get it on the market and get some data back to figure out how best to optimize it. Um, the software we will keep track of, um, but again, no immediate plans to update it. We expect that they will be updated, I just don't know when. Great, thank you. Uh, one last question about how long the entire workflow uh, takes. I know that was alluded to in the presentation, but can you just clarify that, how, how long the library prep, step, library prep step takes and how long the entire workflow takes? Sure. So extraction is about half a day, and then you can fill up the rest of the day if you include the accessioning aspect of it. Um, library prep on eight cases is approximately three days. Um, if when we go to 16 cases, if you're using the same uh, technologist, then we actually would do one day for each of the pa of the batch of eight, and then we finish and we pull together and complete the remaining two days. So that would be four days. But if you have additional personnel, then you can still do them obviously in parallel for three days. And then um, the sequencer itself is about 15 hours, and then followed by analysis, which can be anywhere from four hours to to 10 to 12 hours, depending upon what your bioinformatics pipeline is and what what your hardware um, uh, output is. So you're talking about, and this really depends on whether or not you um, you work through weekends or not. But uh, you're looking at about six days 
um, from start to finish. But if you don't, if you that's you know if you happen to start on a on a Monday, then you'll be finished um, by the following Monday. Um, it'll end sometime over the weekend. But if you happen to start in the middle of the week and you don't work through the weekends, then it could be pushing it um, further. Okay, so one last question. Maybe um, it's it's related to how the essay works. Maybe there was some clarification needed, uh, and that is the novel fusions you find. Are they limited to precise genomic regions that are covered by probes, and um, the, by the hybridization included in the essay, or or can you find novel fusions that are not covered by these probes? So. We did not bias our probe design to known fusion breakpoints. So if if we say a gene is covered on the panel, then we cover all axons of that gene with our probe design. Um, so theoretically, the answer is no. Um, we we should be. It's not limited. Um, the the limitation would just be that one of your genes involved in a fusion is targeted by the panel. But as long as as long as that gene is on the panel, then we should target all regions of that gene, and you should detect all fusions. Provided the fusion breakpoints are close to the exons or or, or abutting the, the exons. If it's deep intronic within the intergenic region, then no, it, in theory, should miss it. Well, if if it creates a fusion partner, even if the breakpoint is in an intron, that fusion is usually between two. Your RNA creates the, the fusion between the oh, two I'm sorry. Ones, true, right? true, true, true. Absolutely. So the the instance where it um, is limited is for rearrangements that, um, like the Ig IGH BCL2, for example, that doesn't actually create a fusion. Um, that just moves a promoter in front of an endogenous gene, so it, it changes the expression levels. So those right. those are challenging. Right. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, how often do you have novel fusions that are likely false positive results? We have not seen one at all. Okay, that was an easy one. <laughs> um, a very specific technical platform question, can the true side RNA fusion panel be run on the next Seq 500? Yes, it can. 24 samples per run. Okay, that was easy too. And then one last question here is, um, how early in the sarcoma patient testing pathway do you recommend doing this NGS fusion testing? So uh, our sarcoma pathologists order it basically on the, on the second day after receiving the, the samples, so quite early. Yeah, that sounds like it's very early. Uh, it looks like this is all the questions we have at this point. So with that, let me thank both of you for fielding all these questions. Thank you very much, Claire Atwell and George Charamis, and also let me thank our sponsor, Illumina. If we didn't have time to any questions that you might have in the next couple of minutes, um, we can have our panelists answer them directly afterward. And as a reminder, please look out for our pop-up survey after you log out to provide us with your feedback. Also, if you missed any part of this webinar and wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. So with that, thank you very much for joining us for this genome webinar.